Hi, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to another installment of our uh, Back to School Update Live. Uh, before we get into any of the details this morning, I'd like to introduce our interpreters and explain how the interpretation works. Bom dia, meu nome é Juliane, bem-vinda a mais uma reunião para, de, para a explicação de De Volta às Aulas. Antes de nós começarmos é, isso tudo, nós vamos estar explicando como que a, é, a parte de intérprete vai estar funcionando. Quando você, é, as pessoas que estão assistindo pelo Facebook, vocês vão estar simplesmente ouvindo essa reunião em inglês. Se você fala português e você gostaria de estar escutando essa reunião toda em português, você pode estar entrando no Zoom. No Zoom, você vai estar na parte é, inferior do, do Zoom, vai ter uma, um globo. Nesse globo, você pode estar clicando e escolhendo a, é, ou português ou espanhol para a sua língua, linguagem preferida. Essa reunião vai ser gravada, mas somente em inglês. Então, se você gostaria de estar escutando essa reunião em português e você está no Facebook, você teria que estar indo para o Zoom. Obrigada. Thank you, Juliana. Mauricio, buenos días. Muy buenos días y gracias por reunirse otra vez con nosotros para esta presentación de Dr. Kramer acerca del regreso de las escuelas, o sea, cómo vamos a regresar y todos los pormenores que podemos ofrecer hasta el momento. Si ustedes quieren escuchar esta traducción en español, pueden ir a su pantalla de Zoom al fondo, abajo, en la parte de abajo, encuentran un globo donde ustedes pueden hacer clic ahí y se van a poner en contacto directo con mi voz. Eh, con, van a escuchar esta, pueden escucharlo también en Facebook Live, y además esta eh, va a ser grabada. Así es que los esperamos y gracias por estar con nosotros. And uh, to give our interpreters a quick snapshot of who's here on Zoom, we're going to launch a language indicator poll. If you're participating in today's event in Spanish or Portuguese, we ask that you indicate that now. The poll is anonymous. E só para poder estar tá ajudando os nossos intérpretes para saber quem é que está aqui, nós estamos lançando um poll com pergunta, é com só para você você poder escolher qual é a linguagem que você que você fala. E essas perguntas é anônima, ninguém vai estar tá sabendo que você vai estar tá respondendo. É simplesmente para estar tá ajudando nossos intérpretes. Ustedes ahorita acaban de ver una pantalla donde pueden indicar qué lenguaje prefieren y donde pueden hacer preguntas. Estas preguntas son totalmente anónimas, solamente las van a poder ver los panelistas y las vamos a tratar de contestarlas a la mayor brevedad al tiempo si es que nos da el, el espacio posible. Ok, gracias. And now we'll begin our interpretation functions. I'd like to just uh, thank everyone who made the, uh, this possible for the interpretation. And we have also uh, learned um, from our community that we also need to, uh, to make it even more accessible. And so starting at our 4 p.m. webinar today, or my 4 p.m. webinar today, we'll be making this available also in American Sign Language. So as we continue to make this more accessible to our community, we really appreciate this opportunity for two-way engagement. As we begin, I want to remind everyone watching that sessions being recorded on Zoom and can be posted to YouTube following the event. It's also being aired on Facebook Live and will be available for viewing after the event has ended. I'll provide some information up front and then move into a question and answer uh, sequence and it, where some of you may have uh, be tuning in for the first time, others this may be your second round, so I've modified the slides a bit to reflect our current, um, current updates as, a, as they stand this morning. Again, I'll address the, uh, the questions at the end. And, you know, there's a lot of questions that do come in, and so we're in the process of collecting a Q&A document, which we'll then share out on our website and uh, as we process this together uh, in the terms of the school reopening. Uh, really, again, once I'm very appreciative of the real-time translation here, it does allow us to keep this contained within a one-hour period, and uh, a large part of which I hope today we can dedicate to uh, responding to questions from the community. And, uh, and, less, and less from me about opening remarks, though I do want to give you an update on those six elements that we've been talking about uh, over, the last, uh, over the last week. All right, so that said, I'm going to pull up a, uh, a slide deck here, if you'll bear with me.
Okay, so this is our uh, back to school updates work in progress. And uh, again, this is framed, as you may recall from last week's session, around six elements uh, that we look at around school reopening. So I'd like to start with the bottom line up front. Um, so in case you have to take you know, one slide away from what's up today that's different from last week, uh, this is that slide. And so uh, there are seven points on here I'll go through. Uh, first, again, just this is a work in progress. Please be patient with us. We continue to uh, get information. Even today, I have another call with the commissioner and information could be updated uh, by the 4 p.m. webinar today. Um, and some of this, I'm not gonna compare what's different from last week. I'm, there's been so many changes, perhaps in the last, uh, last days, I'm not sure I'll know uh, which was <laughs> related to the first time. So let's just go with the current uh, status. Uh, so item number two, bottom line up front, the school calendar is gonna be adjusted for the next school year to reflect 170 school days. Um, this is after some negotiations between the Massachusetts Teachers Association, uh, American Federation of Teachers and the Commissioner's Office to reflect the ne necessary additional time for staff. Um, we have to still work through how those days will specifically be used. We're gonna work with our teachers union uh, to develop that, but presumably this is going to be for professional development around uh, you know, the ways we can engage with families and students in a remote learning environment, uh, also other professional development needs uh, to make sure that we're ready for the appropriate training and safety protocols uh, in our schools. So again, it will be a 170 day school year uh, for our staff. It still continues to be the 180 days plus the additional uh, professional development days. And we'll be modifying the calendar with the school committee uh, very shortly with the, uh, with the new dates and what that means for starting school. The commissioner has made it clear though that we will not be starting uh, you know, any kind of remote learning. It must start before September 16th in terms of what we're doing for school. So those days uh, will again will be detailed in a calendar for you, but just know that it's 170 days school year this year, not 180 days. Uh, what's being proposed here, and this is coming up this evening with the, uh, with the school committee, uh, I'll be presenting, we made this public last week. And again, the, uh, the document is a draft document. This is not a final document. But what's being proposed here, uh, if you watch the meeting last at the last school committee meeting, um, there's some recommendations from the city's Department of Public Health is, uh, is in support of a hybrid model, uh, not a full return to school, but a graduated model. And so what that means is a full remote start, uh, likely a uh, you know, September into October. We have designated uh, points, benchmark points uh, throughout the year. We divided the year in sixths, so we have a, a benchmark point that we can assess at that time um, what the health conditions are, and then prepare ideally, uh, assuming that all is looking well with the, uh, the virus trajectory for a November hybrid start, that would be some students in person and some students um, working remotely in these cohorts, which we'll spell out in detail uh, as, we, as we model these plans. And again, only after we uh, bring this before the school committee for, for their approval. Uh, we also are prioritizing uh, in-person support uh, for identified high need students. And there's more to come on that. Um, that's another area that we're looking to start uh, ideally sooner in the fall. Um, but that's a conversation that continues to be ongoing with the uh, Framingham Teachers Association as we look at how to prioritize that. Again, this is all proposed. Um, this is again, a grad what I'm calling a graduated hybrid model. I'm not sure that's a DESE coined term, but it's one that I think reflects uh, the intent to start fully remote and then in the fall uh, sort of morph into a, um, into a hybrid model. Again, all this is spelled out in the plan, which continues to be uh, you know, a, a work in progress, as I mentioned. Uh, it's important to point out, though, that families do retain the right to have their children continue learning remotely if they so choose. Uh, this is different than a family who may elect to homeschool their child and through that, that paperwork, that process. This is uh, the schools offering um, remote learning as well as in-person learning, and there'll be some structure of that. There may be conditions by which families feel more comfortable uh, keeping the child at home if they can, if they can do that, and, uh, and we'll respect that, of course and then we'll have you engage, have your children engage remotely uh, for as long as, as you need. Of course, you may change your mind at some point uh, and circumstances may change and we'll evaluate uh, how, how that will look as we work, out, work through our plan. But I wanted to point out here as a bottom line is that families will retain that right if they're uncomfortable with a return in any capacity. Um, I, I, I say, I continue to say that we're, we're committed to the aspirational six foot distancing rule, and this is going to be imperfect. Uh, we've tested the three foot rule. There's been 
you know, I get a tremendous amount of emails each day uh, telling me why we should go back to school in person right away to why we should not be in school at all for the next year. And as you can imagine, it's divided right down the middle. Um, there are, is guidance that some districts, um, likely districts that are smaller and maybe have more facility space, that can accommodate all the students back at some perhaps three-foot DESE guidance. Uh, we've adopted the six-foot distancing rule. Uh, again, this is all in collaboration with our city's Department of Public Health and the school committee. More will be discussed on this tonight in open session at 7 p.m. Uh, but again, we're looking to, as, as often as possible, may not be always, but we want to aspire to the six-foot distance, which is really commonplace everywhere you go, as you know. Um, there may be times, however, that that may be lesser as students are passing, though we're working to try to, to minimize uh, that. But again, that's, the, uh, that's our commitment to a six-foot rule versus the three-foot rule, um, as, as uh, you may be seeing proposed in other districts. Uh, we are uh, asking for face coverings for all students and staff looking to have this required. Uh, it, there's been language, as you're probably familiar with, that uh, students under grade two, uh, it's recommended. In our case, uh, in Framingham, we are requiring this of our, of our students and our staff uh, in the interest of keeping everybody safe. Uh, students who are transported, even if they were preschool uh, or first graders, uh, even under the current regulations, would be required to wear uh, a face covering. Um, so if you're on the bus, you'd have to be wearing a face covering. It stands to reason that if you're in school, uh, you should be wearing a face covering as well. Uh, looking to do HVAC upgrades. Many of those can be accomplished between now and September. And uh, we are working in the Buildings and Grounds Department to, uh, to upgrade, as we'll get to a little bit later in the presentation, air filtration systems, uh, air purification, and, uh, and doing, doing what we can to make sure that we create uh, every opportunity for good ventilation. Uh, I want to point out that we are operating, our schools do operate to code in terms of ventilation. This is above and beyond that to improve uh, our operations uh, for the safety of all. And, and finally, my last bottom line up front is that we've scheduled negotiations with the Framingham Teachers Association, as I alluded to earlier, to discuss the elements of the proposed back to school plan, and the school committee review begins this evening. So the plan that was out there is a, is a draft plan for a uh, proposal for a school committee, as I mentioned a number of times. So, we now need to get uh, to some level of agreement on what the plan, the recommended plan, if that's, if that's supported uh, or not, and then to work the details of that plan with our teachers association, including all of our, of our bargaining units. I'm gonna to touch now on each of the six elements very quickly, and then we'll move right to questions. Uh, again, I, some of this will, you know, sort of foreshadowed by my previous comments. Uh, I'm not gonna read all these bullets to you, just they'll just talk quickly about, uh, again, the HVAC systems, looking to do those, uh, those upgrades. Uh, I mentioned already about the six foot distancing goal and then redesigning classrooms and instructional spaces to accommodate that. And then the plan is to, as much as we can, to, uh, to clean out our classrooms, to free up as much space as we can, and also to train uh, our staff and, uh, and our facility staff and others uh, on housekeeping practices to make sure that we're, we're doing our very best to uh, ensure clean and disinfected facilities. I'll give you a minute to process the bullets on that slide before I move on. Again, I do want to move quickly this morning so I can get to your questions. School safety operations, as mentioned already, we are looking pre-K-12 so for, for mask wearing, for face covering wearing. Uh, we're also working with additional safety precautions and training for our school nurses in supporting students with disabilities uh, where physical distancing protocols um, may be more of a challenge. And I also want to give a particular shout out once again, as I did last week to Framingham the Disability Commission, we generously, generously donated clear masks through some requests that had come in uh, previously. You know, could we have this for all students? And, and certainly we want to uh, get as many clear masks as we can. And I know the Disability Commission is working hard to do that. And uh, we're very appreciative. It makes a big difference in our view if our students can see uh, the mouths of their teachers as they talk, especially if they're learning to form words and form uh, letter sounds. And certainly students with disabilities who need this, uh, this level of access and so we're grateful to our partnership with the Disability Commission for that. Uh, personal hygiene, hand washing, these are the, probably the standard reminders that you can imagine are, are everywhere, and we'll include, to do that, uh, include that in our buildings as well, frequent reminders about hand washing and, uh, san and hand sanitizing. Uh, also, the, uh, important to point out the medical waiting room, this is now uh, part of our, of our plan, which is separate from the nurse's office if we have students or staff who are symptomatic with COVID-19 and then protocols for isolation and discharge uh, for, uh, for those who become sick. Again, this is all detailed in the plan, but if you haven't read the 65-page document as it exists, 
uh, I encourage you to do so, as that will be the topic of conversation uh, this evening. We've talked about the whole child before, and, and important to emphasize this. We, we really are looking at a schedule to design that, um, that really can sort of pick up and put down depending on the circumstances. What I mean by that is if we're in a fully, let's say we're in a fully in-person uh, model, if that were the case, um, which is not projected for the short term. Um, but if we suddenly had to close a school as a result of uh, a COVID-19 case, uh, we may have to pivot immediately to a full remote. And so we want to keep a schedule that's nimble enough to allow for, uh, for students and, and staff to interact so, as close to as possible as they would in person. We know, though, it's important to point out again that nothing will replace that in-person experience. That is ultimately the goal. We just can't get there until it's safe to do so and until we have the facility to accommodate the appropriate social distancing and safety requirements. So, so that's why we're not proposing, why I'm not proposing coming back at this time uh, full on in person. Again, there are communities that may be able to do that. They, those communities are likely smaller than Framingham and they likely have more facility space to make those accommodations. And they may be honoring the three foot distancing rule and not the six foot distancing rule. So I can't speak to what other communities decision making is, um, but that's why we've chosen the, uh, the, the path that we, we are proposing here. And we also want to make sure we, uh, we support our students uh, through this time. We understand that um, you know, coming back, whether it's in a remote environment, there hasn't been that closure that students had with their last year teacher. And now there's this first interaction with their new teacher that's going to be still in a virtual environment. There's challenges that come with all of this, and we're mindful of, of, those, uh, of those, those needs and those challenges and the supports that our students need. And so we continue to prioritize that by leveraging our support staff to make regular outreach to families and, uh, and do the best we can in the environment that we have to make sure that, those, uh, that we're paying close attention to the, to the mental health and psychological needs of our children and our staff. I touched on this piece already, uh, social emotional learning. We're looking to still build this into our program, uh, as I mentioned. And then also simultaneously, we're working, as you know, from previous conversations around discipline and behavioral expectations. We're, we're well underway, still sort of a separate path, but working hard just as hard on this code of character, conduct, and support uh, to ensure consistency of behaviors uh, and behavioral expectations across the district. This is a work in progress that will continue to include and engage our community voice, teacher voice, student voice. Uh, there'll be additional challenges with, uh, with, that come with remote learning in terms of, um, or even in person, as it comes to students who take masks off or who, you know, these kinds of uh, what might be viewed as disciplinary to make sure that these are teaching opportunities, that these are restorative opportunities, not punitive. We don't want to be in a place of punishing students, you know, for, for behaviors. We want to get in a place where the behaviors are, we recognize the antecedent and we get ahead of that by being restorative in our work. This is the ongoing goal of our district, and we're making good progress um, despite the COVID-19 circumstances toward that end through our Department of um, Health and Wellness and certainly with our administrative team. So there'll be more coming out on that as well. I just wanted to point out as we look at the whole child, that this is not forgotten or, 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 or shelved work. This is very important for us to pursue uh, simultaneously as we talk about how to reinvent education and the return to school plan. School personnel, I mentioned earlier about professional development, planning for our teachers to come back and have the tools and resources they need. Uh, again, we'll continue to, uh, to have those discussions with our staff as to which are the priorities for them and for our district as we also look at our strategic plan for the next three years. And that we also want to work to support our staff. Um, you know, there are a number of, uh, of rules that apply or laws that apply as it relates to COVID-19 and um, what rights staff may have uh, relative to their own families. Uh, or child care needs uh, as we work through this. So this, there's a lot to be considered here um, as we work with our staff. So all of this is being taken up for conversation uh, as part of our ongoing bargaining framing and teachers association and others. And uh, we'll get, you know, obviously continue to update our staff as we have been with those. I'll be meeting also with the staff. I've arranged for our uh, first ever actually uh, full on Framingham public school staff meeting tomorrow morning. Uh, at 7.30. That will be to follow up on this presentation, tonight's school committee presentation, and just to give our staff an update. Um, one of the benefits of, of having an online environment like this is it allows for me to engage with, uh, you know, all 2,000 of our, of our staff, which I couldn't do in person, uh, even in non-COVID-19 times. 
academics, uh, again, just to reiterate some points that were made at the last, at the last meeting, but with some more specificity here around addressing learning gaps that continues to be our, our, our priority. We don't want to have students glued to screens all day any more than we want our teachers glued to screens all day. So we're going to have to think very creatively about how we get full structured school days uh, in place. And we also have time for uh, screen breaks, uh, mask breaks when we're in person, and, uh, and to make sure that we're paying uh, attention to the standards that we're advancing, uh, teaching and learning and moving it forward, not in this sort of crisis mode of learning as we experienced uh, in, in March. So again, this is work that's happening with our in, in district, with our task force, our planning teams, of teachers and administrators. This is ongoing and we'll continue to, uh, to keep you uh, uh, up to speed on this. And principals will, once we start to move from a specific plan to a school-based plan, you'll be hearing from your building principals, uh, likely around these same very same topics, uh, but at a school-based level. So you know how it translates specifically uh, for your child at their grade level. And again, we're working on a system to provide students with materials they'll need so they have this at-home kit, including the Chromebooks, making sure our families have uh, regular, reliable uh, access to the internet and other kinds of tools they need. And some more information will be forthcoming there. Finally, the communication element of this is uh, we're going to be continuing to collaborate with our youth serving programs. As you may have seen, there are some youth serving programs in our community that are able to accommodate students following their guidelines, which are, which are governed differently. And so we want to make sure we continue our strong partnership there to uh, provide supports uh, and to stay in close communication with, uh, again, with area, with area providers. And so there are meetings that are coordinated uh, coming up. There's one coming up next week where we can continue to be tight in our alignment there, uh, making sure that we're serving our students well. Uh, these updates will continue. I do want to get some, some, some feedback from you as to um, what, what works? Does the, uh, I'm guessing that the 10.30 and the 4 p.m. times are not necessarily ideal times. I'm trying to provide two periods in the day, uh, but perhaps a, an evening time uh, maybe works better. Uh, so we can bring this down to a single time. That might be easier as well for, uh, for our interpreters, including American Sign Language, to be added. Uh, if that works for you, uh, maybe throw me a message that tells me what works. We'll let us know. Uh, if there's a time or, you know, we're happy to take your feedback on this. The purpose of these webinars is to inform our community. And so if it's not working for the community in terms of time of day or day of the week, I want to know that so we can get this right so that the time is fruitful and useful and not interrupting your day. And uh, so let me know how that can be better. And we'll do our best to see where we land on that to accommodate everyone's interest. Again, the sessions will be recorded. So if you do miss them, you won't have the benefit of the real time uh, question and answer, but you will have a chance to at least see the dialogue and what the, uh, the de details are. You yeah, mentioned about principals communication already. The full back to school plan will be presented tonight uh, again at 7 p.m. If you want to tune into that meeting, uh, that'll be with the school committee and once again with the uh, city's Department of Public Health and the Board of Health uh, in attendance. I also wanted to add to this these proposed reopening checkpoints. Uh, so as we consider this remote start, as I mentioned, this graduated, graduated um, hybrid model, October 19th is our first designated, and again, as proposed, is our first designated checkpoint, which would mean that, let's say, uh, all things are going remarkably well, case counts are declining, people are safe, we're not seeing these, um, these you know, any kinds of spiking, then we'll be planning for a, uh, for a hybrid return in November. So it gives us that space of time. We'll already be planning for that, but it gives us that sort of fair warning to our families so that you can uh, adjust, you know, accommodate as childcare needs, work needs, whatever it may be. And so we've identified these five points throughout the year. As I mentioned at the last webinar, we've chosen these points. Instead of making it a clean semester break or quarter, we wanted to just give more frequency, more intervals at which we can check in and see how we're doing and see how soon we may be able to, uh, to evolve into getting us back to school. I mean, ideally, right, we're back full in person, everybody, students, staff, as soon as possible. But we just can't do that until we have the space to do so in our schools, given the six foot distancing, understanding that that will be probably three to six foot, and given the fact that we have uh, given our enrollment of our district and, uh, and all those restrictions that come around with the COVID-19 uh, safe reopening school. And so that's why we're, we're in, this, uh, in this place. So I'm gonna move it now right to the back to school uh, questions and answers. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'll go to a different slide deck. Uh, where the questions will be prompted, and I'll do my best to read uh, questions and respond to them uh, in real time. And again, anything that we don't miss, we'll continue to track those 
and get back to everybody. So, okay, so we just thanks for bearing with me as I'm trying to manage multiple screens and talk to you at the same time. I'm going to just read, uh, it, it came to my attention uh, at the last time that I was reading through these questions, you know, in my own mind and not sharing them, thinking that everyone could see them, but that's not the case. So I'm going to read the questions and then respond to the questions and I'll see how far I can get uh, down the list. Uh, and I'll read comments too. So, and again, if this is helpful to you, let us know that too. Anything, anything we can do to make communication better and clearer and more precise and more timely is what we want to be doing. So that feedback is important. You know, um, I have broad shoulders. I can take the feedback. But if we're doing a good job, tell us that too, because I want to make sure that, um, that I relay that information to those who are working so hard to make these possible, these webinars possible. Um, so one is thank you. Uh, here's the first comment that I'm reading. Uh, thank you for all this information and the hard work by FPS. Will online instruction for lower grades, K through two, be largely asynchronous or synchronous? And so, um, I think here the, the answer is it's really not broken down that way by grade level being, it's gonna be how we divide the school out by, you know, um, if, by cohort. So you may find that you, know, you have students coming to school, this is we're looking at this whole thing systemically, pre-K 12, not breaking it down by elementary or by, uh, by secondary. Ideally, we'd like to see as much uh, synchronous learning as possible, but we also don't wanna have students in front of a screen all day uh, so we have to think about how to balance that. So I think we're looking to see how much of the day can we recreate in a virtual environment. Um, and, and then there'll be no doubt some asynchronous part to this. This is a, a conversation that we're having with the uh, Teachers Association as we work through the details of, of any plan that, that we proceed with. But it's, uh, it's not necessarily different for the lower grades. We want our high school and our elementary school and our preschool kids to be engaged with their teachers. Um, as much as possible in real time as possible, at least from my view. The next question is, when will we know which days of the week students will possibly be going to school and if and when the hybrid starts? So we're working through that now. Uh, the hybrid, again, would be proposed to start here late fall. As you know, I mentioned the October checkpoint, looking for, uh, again, for November return. And then we'll be spelling out well ahead of that what those schedules will look like. Uh, we in fact have some draft schedules that are part of that back to school plan. If you uh, want to take a look at that on our website and uh, we'll be discussing that this evening as well. Uh, this evening at school committee, I've invited our, our entire team of senior leaders, senior leaders. Um, so our assistant superintendents and our directors to answer specific questions. So I think tonight will be very informative uh, for some of these other, other questions to be answered. Um, but we are, and this is a work in progress about the, uh, the actual structure of cohort A, cohort B, uh, for example. Um, for parents who choose at home learning for the entire school year, will their child's seat be held at their current school? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. So if you're, if you're, this is a uh, school committee, this, this emerged in the document. I say yes, because unless the plan, it's, it, it's not approved in the plan currently, it does include the school committee's goals and priorities. One of which is, uh, I think which number it is, maybe it's uh, seven or eight on that list is about keeping the, um, a child who's enrolled in school, but you're not comfortable sending them, or for whatever reason, we haven't opened the doors to a hybrid or a full return. A parent may elect, or a parent may elect to keep their child home for the year in a remote environment. Uh, so we will honor placement uh, in that regard. This is different though than homeschooling. If you choose to homeschool uh, your child, that's a different process, and effectively it's uh, a step back from, um, from public school so that in that case, the space would be open. But if you're choosing just to, uh, to retain the right for remote learning, uh, you'd be able to do that and maintain the space for the later that school year or the next school year as you uh, advance to the next grade. How can we guarantee the schools will have proper PPE, cleaning supplies, tissues, if the public are having a hard time finding these things? Uh, so we began procuring PPE um, months ago and uh, we have an ability through our Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to procure those uh, supplies. And we're very comfortable that we have the uh, proper PPE, cleaning supplies, tissues, and so forth uh, to support our students and staff. 
How much time a day would you expect elementary students to be on a computer during fully remote or at home hybrid instruction? That's a great question. I think, you know, we've had, it's been mixed. I know that in the past when we had the sort of crisis mode of learning, um, there's been, you know, the providing of a resource calendar and, and activities and the parents being a primary educator at home. Uh, my expectation is all that's going to change and that we're going to be really driving forward and taking all that we've learned and providing additional professional development so that we can move the school day forward. And so I think you'll see a change from uh, what's going to be happening in terms of the amount of time. We're not, well, I don't want to speak for our teachers association on that. We do have to engage in those conversations about what we expect a full day to look like. Um, but we do expect that there to be one uh, more effort of engagement uh, with our staff, with our, with our, with our students with regularity. And, uh, and also with enough time for breaks, screen breaks and things so that our students aren't just sitting in front of a, of a laptop or a Chromebook um, all day long. That's not gonna be healthy either. Uh, so we're trying to find that, that balance. So more to come as we work through the nuances of the, uh, of the elementary and uh, middle and high school schedules for that matter. Question for the remote, the next question is, I'm sorry, for the remote model, are teachers gonna be teaching online from their classrooms or from home? And so this is a, uh, an ongoing conversation. Um, what I, what I, my preference would be that our teachers, based on some survey data that I've received from our staff about having access to whiteboards and manipulatives and things that might be in a classroom, or even having students to have a, a feel, a vibe of being in their room, even if they're not there in person, um, it seems to me that an in-person return for staff would be ideal. That said, though, I am mindful that we have to make sure that returning to school is also safe, not only for our students, but for our staff. So before we would even propose such a thing, we have to make sure that our ventilation system, as I mentioned, although they're already uh, at code, we want to make sure that we've upgraded them to ensure the safest possible return for our staff. Uh, this is an ongoing conversation uh, for sure, and there may be uh, circumstances that are warranted um, where staff members may not be able to come into school for any number of reasons. Um, as a result of COVID-19 and the rights that are afforded to employees uh, under the law. And in those cases, we would work with teachers to, uh, to find a, a mode that works for them. And that mode might be uh, remote teaching uh, from their homes or from someplace that's not their classroom. So there could be a combination to answer that question. But um, if I had to pick, my preference would be to have our teachers come back uh, to the classrooms to start. The reason for that, by the way, uh, is in my view, is it's, a grad, it's another example of a graduated approach to returning back to whatever normalcy school will be. And I think if we can feel comfortable with our staff coming in ahead of our students with plenty of social distancing space, all the safety and cleaning protocols in place, and knowing that, that once we see that that's working and that we're not having COVID-19 cases spike ourselves, then we can then feel more comfortable and hopefully assure others that it's then safe to bring in our students. I, um, I'm concerned about the idea of bringing in students and staff for the first time together all at once in November without first um, making the effort to bring back in small scale uh, staff and students as we explore uh, and move into a hybrid. But again, we're gonna continue to work very closely with the Department of Public Health, monitor the health conditions with our buildings and grounds department to make sure that what we're doing uh, considers the safety of everybody. How will you ensure, the next question is, um, hi, how will you ensure the high school students actually see teachers and classmates? My daughter didn't see one teacher from March to June. It was difficult to get in touch with teachers. Uh, she was on her own for a few classes. Would it be a set start time and set class times via Zoom? I would say the answer is yes, it's gonna be very different. We'll be tracking attendance this year through this process. So uh, we'll be grading. Um, so this is very different. This is uh, more like what school once was, but in a different setting. And so it comes with that lots of changes in working conditions that have to be discussed uh, with our teachers. So I'll be relaying this, um, this point, of course. Uh, I'm sure there's members of our association who are, who are watching and participating, and certainly we'll carry this forward as we continue our discussions in bargaining. Uh, next question is, will the daycare at the high school be open at the start of the school year? Uh, we are, we're working on a response to that. I don't, I don't want to give false information on that one. I know there's going to be some daycare provisions that we're looking at for, for staff um, and for families, but I, I'm not sure on that. So um, we'll, we'll get an answer and we'll put that in the Q&A document. I know I had an email that came with a similar question, maybe from the same person. So uh, we'll be sure to get back to you right away uh, on that question. I'm sorry I don't have that answer. I, want to, I just want to make sure I give the, uh, 
the information that I know is accurate. Uh, will teachers be allowed to teach remotely from their classroom? So another related question that they've already addressed. Uh, the answer is yes. I mean, I, I think that would be great uh, if I'm a kid and I'm seeing my teacher in her class and she's maybe or he is sitting in the circle where they would have morning meeting. Uh, how cool would that be, I think, you know, to, to have that connection and it's not fully disconnected from school. It gives that real sense of, of being back uh, in a school building, even though it's virtual for students. Um, Will middle school students have Chromebooks to use at home? We are, we're working on making sure that all of our families, you know, when we rolled out Chromebooks uh, last year, we did that. And again, as everything seemed to be in a panic crisis mode. We were trying to get as many Chromebooks out as possible. I would like to see us have an opportunity for staff and for administrators to engage with families, even through the remote learning period. This could be done in small scale where families can come to school, make sure they pick up the resources they need, that they have Chromebooks, so that everybody has access to an internet device and a reliable internet connection uh, in order to engage. So we wanna make sure that, especially for families who don't have another uh, means at home, we absolutely wanna get these in the hands of all of our students. Uh, there are enough to go around. We have to just make sure that we get them in the hands of everyone uh, now that we have some time and space to do that. Are there health exemptions for students wearing masks? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, and so that will be case by case basis. There may be, uh, there may be situations where students cannot uh, and, and we'll certainly uh, work to, uh, to accommodate those, those medically ex medical exemptions. Um, it's come up to around face shields versus masks. Uh, so face shields are not uh, right now approved as an alternative. Uh, where you see face shields is, tends to be in conjunction with uh, the face covering, which we know to be one of the best preventative measures. Uh, so at this point, the, uh, the guidance we've received on that is the uh, students will, be, will, will all be required by Framingham's proposal, and my proposal, I suppose, it would be we'd have all of our students and staff, pre-K-12, wearing masks. Um, there may be medical exceptions to the rule, which we'll address on a case-by-case -case basis. And, uh, and again, face shields, uh, while that might be additional and maybe appropriate in certain medical circumstances, uh, it is not an alternative at this point. Uh, will the hybrid model be one week at school and one week remotely? Um, that, is, that is the plan. There's a lot of different iterations of this where some districts are doing a couple of days and then shutting down for full remote and then coming back for a couple of days. Uh, our proposal is looking for a one week on, one week uh, off model. And there, again, the, part of that proposal, however, is, is also addressing our high needs population of students, students on, um, on IEPs, for example, or who require in-person services, students with language learning needs where this is much more effectively accomplished in person. We're certainly discussing this with our teachers association, with the school committee, as to how we can begin to bring students back as soon as possible in small numbers. So not the full hybrid model, but bringing back students in smaller numbers. And those uh, students uh, who have been determined to have the highest need would likely be going to school uh, full time throughout the school year, once the, even in the hybrid, where they need to have that in person uh, in order to be compliant with their educational program. And so, uh, but generally speaking, the hybrid model is proposed now to be a week on, week off. Uh, who, who the students are in those respective cohorts uh, is, being, is, uh, is being determined. We're also trying to use that as an opportunity to transport as many students as possible as well. I know I didn't mention transportation in one of the, uh, the element areas, but we are mindful that the impact of restrictions on transportation may mean that we can't transport a number of families. So I'm hopeful that by having a cohort model in this regard, we may be able to access transportation for more of our families than we could otherwise. If we brought everybody back to school, say, hypothetically, uh, in September, based on COVID-19 restrictions for social distancing, we would need in excess of 150 school buses to accommodate the restrictions, to accommodate all of our students that were transported. And it's just not, it's just not possible. How will assignments and tests be graded if remote learning is chosen? So assignments will be, and tests will be graded and so depending on the grade level, we'll discuss all of this in much greater detail. A lot of this is laid out in the plan. Um, and so I would encourage you just to read back into that one because at the high school secondary level, for example, maybe use Canvas as a platform or Google Classroom may be the chosen model at the elementary level. And so, uh, but again, there's an expectation of student attendance, check-ins, a regular, in my view, there needs to be a regular start and end to a school day in this. And that, so we have it as structured as we, as we possibly can. Uh, when breaking into, out into cohorts is the next question, will you be keeping families together? That's the intention. That is the intention. So you may see that we have to go, in some cases, alphabetical in order to make that happen. 
we really don't want to see families that are being divided and having to send. We understand that all that I've said already is a huge impracticality for most, most people. Um, but we are facing a pandemic and trying to uh, make the best that we can of education in that situation without creating a spike in our school. So we do want to keep it. And it also helps to keep uh, family units together uh, for exposure reasons and keeping cohorts very tight in that regard. So we will be looking to keep families together as, to the extent we can. Uh, the other next question was the scheduling special education services being discussed along with the overall scheduling. I did mention that the response to that already. Yes, in fact, I'd like to prioritize, uh, as I mentioned in previous conversations, uh, special education services for students uh, whom, in my opinion, we've not served well uh, in, in since we closed school in March. And there's, uh, I'm really concerned, as many of you are, about the regression, particularly for students who require specialized programming to be, programming to be successful. And so that will continue to be a priority conversation for us. Have MCAS tests been canceled for this year? Uh, that is, that's above me. Uh, so MCAS tests are determined by the uh, commissioner and through the state uh, board of education. There have been conversations around that, uh, and I'll be interested to see if that gets raised this morning on my call uh, with the commissioner. But at this point, uh, it's a discussion, but there's been no cancellation uh, that I'm aware of for, uh, for the coming school year. And I guess I'll share a, a positive comment here. Up until an hour, about an hour ago, my husband and I had more or less resigned to having our third grader be a remote student for the entire 2020-2021 school year. This meeting has changed my mind. To say that you're doing an excellent job to keep students and staff safe is an understatement. I'm beyond impressed with Framingham's plan as it has been presented. I wish more districts would follow your lead. Good job, Framingham. Well, thanks for that one. I appreciate that. Um, we're doing our best. And I'm, I'm leveling with you. I'm telling you everything I know as I know it, and it's imperfect. And it's not great, and it's news that's going to make life difficult for your family, and for our staff, and for the families of our staff, and for me, and for everybody involved. And I recognize that. And believe me, uh, this pandemic can't be behind us soon enough. So again, I go back to my bottom line up front. Uh, be patient with us. We're doing the best we possibly can. And I know I have a lot of emails in my inbox. I'm going to get to them, I promise you. Uh, but I encourage you uh, to continue to follow these webinars because the information keeps changing um, by the day. Uh, given the next, the next point here is given the proposed checkpoint system, if we miss the October 19th date, does that mean school will be fully remote for the first half of the school year till January? Is it possible to have more frequent checkpoints, possibly monthly? Yeah, I mean, I think anything is possible with that. What I didn't want to do is, was to sort of box us into a semester decision. You know, or having to make a decision now for the whole year. Some districts have done that in other states, as you may be following. There are districts that have chosen to go remote all year already. Um, and so I'm trying to avoid us doing that, which is why there's six checkpoints as opposed to there being, um, you know, two or three in a trimester or, or four in a quarter system. But to also leave enough, leave enough um, lead time for families and staff to prepare for whatever is next. Uh, we can certainly look and see about additional checkpoints. Certainly, if we find that the, the, um, the, the, the health trajectory has changed, we can move sooner than that. These are just really just benchmarks, not, not dissimilar from what the state did, what the governor did in terms of phase of reopening of the economy. You, you knew you had something to kind of aspire to by a certain checkpoint date, uh, but that can be flexible. I think it's just it's important. That the takeaway here is it's important that there's sufficient notice for everybody to make sure our teachers have enough notice and that our, our students have enough notice, our families have enough notice to prepare for uh, coming back in whatever capacity. And certainly if we're coming back full scale, uh, you know, which I'd love to see, we want to give you enough notice to plan for that, as that may change uh, people's working conditions uh, that they have, uh, their, their own jobs and, and, and accommodations that may be hopefully being made by your employers. Um, how will lunch be served? So we're working through that uh, logistic as well. And um, <laughs> whether it's in the classroom when we do come back or it's done in the cafeteria with six foot distancing or it's a grab and go kind of solution, uh, that, that continues to be a conversation that we're having. And, uh, and it creates some challenges. You can imagine even if you had 50% of Framingham High School attending, you'd have a challenge keeping six foot distancing in a lunch line. And so we have to, uh, to work to accommodate that. So that's a work in progress that we have with our food services department. And uh, we're looking at some options there, whether we eat in the cafeteria, eat in classrooms, 
uh, or again, have something as a grab and go uh, solution. We're looking at all of those. What a positive comment. Appreciate your efforts keeping us informed of the decision making in the process. Thanks for that. Uh, what are the cleaning products, machines, processes you'll be using, and how often? Um, we'll provide that in the plan. We are looking at um, these, some, some, I'm going to say all this wrong. It's, it's, it's out of my wheelhouse. The, uh, we're looking at ionization, you know, like sort of the Clorox 360 kinds of devices that are, uh, that are uh, we're going to be looking to purchase. We have some already, looking for additional, but uh, looking also to, in addition to cleaning, the ventilation, running our, our ventilation systems more frequently than we normally would. It'll be an increased cost, of course, on, on, on utilities. It won't be the kind of um, uh, energy savings you might otherwise see in a non-COVID-19 pandemic year. Um, so we're looking to run those much more frequently. And the cleaning, uh, we're following all the uh, recommended state health guidelines on that. And a lot of this detail is provided in the plan, and we'll be sure to spell, out, spell, that, spell that out in more detail in the Q&A document. I apologize, I don't have that uh, top of mind uh, to respond to that question. through the questions. Um, are gators approved as masks? Uh, interesting, uh, those are, so for people who are not familiar with that, that those are the, um, the kinds of, as I understand it, the kinds of cloth things you pull up over your, over your face. I mean, we're looking at face coverings. So I, I think what, when we're encouraging families to provide whatever's comfortable for their child and to, uh, to obviously to avoid the uh, transmission of, of uh, particles. So I think uh, gators, unless, I'm, unless I hear otherwise from the Department of Public Health, is probably better served by uh, Dr. Wong, but I, I don't uh, I don't foresee a problem with face coverings uh, provided that they they are uh, worn over the nose and mouth uh, to prevent that. I know this question that had come up around band and chorus. These are other interesting areas that we're um, looking to how to how to how to manage uh, the idea of playing instruments um, and the uh, you know producing particles you know through one saliva or singing uh, does present additional challenges. Uh, for us that we're looking to see about ways to solve. Some of that's being resolved through outdoor uh, instruction, which we're also looking at as well, and, and hopefully we can come back at a time, say November, when the mosquitoes are gone and uh, we can, it's still nice enough weather to be outside and we can spread everybody out and, uh, and do that. That would lend itself very nicely, it seems to me, uh, for some of these kinds of programs. So we'll continue to evaluate uh, that with the latest guidance. There's continues to be research evolving around banding chorus in particular. Uh, this is a comment here. I just want to be clear, you're pushing for keeping the six foot distance as opposed to the three feet, right? The answer is yes. I'm absolutely pushing for the six foot distance as opposed to the three foot, which has been approved by the DESE. Um, again, this will come before the school committee uh, to consider as well as part of this plan. Uh, just to be clear, there'll be times where we cannot accommodate six foot distance. I can't promise we're always going to be in a six foot distance. It's unrealistic to expect that. Uh, that's the aspirational, that's the goal of six feet, and we're going to try to measure everything we can and how we move and how we behave around that six foot marker. There may be times that it's less so than six feet, um, but certainly not less than three feet. So we are still looking to, to fulfill or meet the demand of the ESE requirement, but we're not building our model around the three foot standard. Because in my view, a three foot standard means zero foot standard. It means that we're sending students back to three feet, we're going to be shoulder to shoulder. At six feet, we might be three feet away during passing time. So I think that's the better standard to follow. And so um, while it won't be necessarily always perfect, the six foot distance is what we're aspiring to achieve. Uh, we considered clear masks for two-way language students and teachers as well. I, absolutely, you know, I, I think that you know, we, have a, we have a bounty, a good bounty of them right now, and we'll, we'll, we'll get those out uh, as I think it makes good sense. Anytime we're students learning language, um, and developing language skills, this is really important and certainly will prioritize clear masks uh, in that regard. Uh, it really depends on the quantity of that and we can secure some, as I mentioned earlier in the uh, presentation, from the city's um, uh, disability commission. So we're grateful uh, to have that to start the year when we do come back uh, in person to some extent. Positive comment again, the FPS custodial staff have been outstanding throughout all of this. Just a public thank you for all they have done and will do in this challenging year. And I want to echo that as well. Our custodians have really been cleaning every square inch of our buildings and getting ready for 
Um, for return to school, clearing out classrooms and making space that we have room in the classrooms that, to keep that social distance. So it's different than ever before. And so I appreciate the, uh, the public comment on that. Uh, this is a question, the initial evaluation for IEPs and 504s were canceled this spring. Will these meetings be prioritized so students can get the instructional support they may need, especially in the current environment? Uh, this evening, we're going to be having a much more detailed presentation uh, from Laura Spear, Director of Special Education, uh, around IEPs, and certainly uh, Judy Steyer, our Director of Health and Wellness, uh, who oversees our Section 504s um, in the district, will both be uh, on that call this evening. But we are still going forward with, with virtual virtual meetings, um, and the uh, the idea that we want to make sure we get support uh, to students is absolutely maintains a priority in this environment. So more to come on how and when our students will get that support, whether that's in person or through a remote means. Um, that's a that's a conversation that we continue to have with the teachers association, and uh, we'll keep you posted on that. And again, Laura Spear will likely have more updates for you this evening, and certainly she can respond. Uh, to the Q&A document, uh, as well with more details on that. If and when, the next question is, if and when a COVID vaccine is available, will all students be required to get the vaccine, just like other vaccine, vaccines from early childhood? Uh, I'll raise that question with the uh, city's Department of Public Health. It seems to me it would be a great practice for us to have vaccine clinics and to get uh, as many uh, students and staff and everyone in our community vaccinated. Um, there may be those who are opposed to that. So I'll have to find out what the requirement is and how much we can uh, press on vaccinations. Uh, I'll say when they come and hopefully, hopefully soon. Will the full curriculum be covered this year is the next question. Uh, it's not been made clear, you know, last year the department uh, provided these sort of power standards that they wanted districts to, uh, to move through over the course of the school year. Um, these are sort of the essential standards. My expectation right now from the VESE is that the full curriculum will be covered. Uh, that's, that's the intention. Uh, but I'll let you know if that, if that guidance changes at this point. That's what I'm, uh, that's, what I'm that's my understanding. Uh, the next comment, I found at the end of last year, many teachers uh, had used different platforms. It was confusing at times. Will this be more condensed? You know, we're trying to, to balance the comfort of what teachers are using at the same time also make it consistent for us across the district as to what we're using for platforms. And so we are trying to push on uh, Canvas at the secondary level and Google Classroom uh, at the elementary level. But more to come on how we use platforms as we work with our teachers on that and we'll provide that in the, uh, again, there's some of, the, some of this detail that's been provided in the back to school plan as well. Uh, and the comment in here, just uh, just take this opportunity to promote the school committee meeting tonight, which I've mentioned a few times uh, in, during this webinar, and that all the documents are on the website to be reviewed. So that's a great resource. Take a look at that. I know it's a 65-page document to review, but I think a lot of the questions that are being raised here are addressed in there, maybe not as conveniently as this webinar format, but I would encourage you to take a look and look at all the uh, supporting documentation, because as part of that plan, there are links in there to surveys that we've conducted, uh, that I think may be useful to paint the entire picture that we're considering. And um, we'll do our best to get this Q&A document, document out as soon as possible, but it does take time as we're trying our best to make sure we make it accessible to all of our families uh, with translations. Feedback that I'm getting here in real time from uh, those who are, who are uh, working behind the scenes are saying that it seems that uh, most would like to have an evening webinar so we can look to schedule that webinar at that time. Um, okay, so I'm right, gonna press you a little bit more for those of you who are on this webinar today, tell me a little bit more. So let's say we don't want to offer a, meet, a morning, we don't offer an afternoon perhaps, we just do a single event in the evening. Uh, what time would work for everybody? And uh, let's, you know, let us know, six o'clock, seven o'clock. I'm guessing most events and most meetings in Framingham, uh, as you know, happen around 7 p.m. And so maybe that's the starting point. So if you feel it's something different than that, uh, let me know that. Again, I'm trying to make this uh, information as useful as possible for our community and we want as many people participating as, as absolutely possible. Another positive co comment. I know this is difficult and not everyone will be happy with the outcome. I personally want to say thank you for offering a remote plan to parents and kids that are not comfortable sending their kids back to school. It's such a relief to our family knowing that we do not have to send our kids back physically. And so, um, you're welcome, and we'll continue to uh, to evolve with that. Unless I've missed something, I think the questions have um, 
have more or less been answered. There may be some nuanced questions that I'll move into the Q&A document, but I, uh, we have about five minutes remaining. So uh, if there are any additional questions, I'll just hang on for another minute or so before I give you a few extra minutes back in the day. And while we're pausing, I just want to say thank you again to, um, to our interpreters uh, who are making this accessible to our families. Uh, my thanks to, uh, to Rochelle Santos, our media communications uh, manager, uh, who's designed this backend to make this successful, and to Amy Kane, my executive assistant, who's working hard to get these questions from Facebook Live and through the chat into a document that I can facilitate in real time. So I appreciate all the my team who's helping, and certainly our entire district team of administrators, teachers, and the school committee who will be charged um, this evening with reviewing this plan in more detail and ultimately coming up with a uh, proposal that, that will support our students. Last time, I'll, I'll just reiterate one more time, the question came up about outdoor birthing. So at this point, again, assuming that we come back to school in November and we are still starting remotely as proposed in the first couple of months of school, uh, outdoor learning may very likely be an option for us because we'll hopefully be away from the uh, the West Nile virus and Triple E threats that mosquitoes bring, and hopefully that will be past us. Hopefully the weather will be nice enough to be able to engage in outdoor learning. Um, and so that's an option. I think it's a good option for us, certainly to look at recess time and how we can incorporate that or maybe more of that as we consider breaks for students uh, where there may be opportunities for mask breaks. And um, I think the more we can capitalize on using the outdoors and getting fresh air, the better. And so we'll continue to, uh, to look at our Department of Public Health on, on that guidance. The Explorers question came in about the Explorers program, how the Explorers program function in a hybrid model. There will be a limited number of seats uh, because the uh, Explorers program reports under the uh, Department of Early Education in here. Um, they may have, uh, they have certain opportunities they can extend to families. So there will be a wait list uh, for what they can offer in an in-person experience or in a hybrid experience. And so I'll we'll have a uh, Tiffany Lilly, who's our, um, our director, community resource development director, um, respond to that with much more detail in a Q&A document. So I just encourage you to check back uh, on that document for more information and, um, and perhaps she'll speak to that point tonight as well at school committee. So thanks for raising that. And I'm sorry I can't answer every single question that's thrown at me, I'll do my best, um, but I, there's some that are just, um, are just a little bit more nuanced and I don't wanna give misinformation. Okay, I'm not seeing any new questions popping up in the feed, so I'm going to use that as my cue to not uh, not take more of your time than need be. And so I would like to uh, say thank you to all of you for participating. If there's questions that we have not answered or have not answered in this, uh, be sure they get uh, um, captured in the chat, and we'll move that over to the Q&A document, which we'll then respond to with our team and share back with everybody uh, with translations. So thank you all for your time and attention this morning. I hope that, once again, I hope this was helpful. And I uh, look forward to uh, talking with you again, I guess, next week and some, some evening uh, next week, and we'll get that on the calendar. And uh, happy to have uh, our interpreters come back. And uh, again, feel free to join me this afternoon uh, at 4 o'clock. There may be new information. I'll, use, I'll be using the same slides unless there's new information that's coming to me um, from the commissioner uh, following a call this afternoon. If I do have new information, I'll include that. But otherwise, it will be a, uh, more or less a repeat to the extent that I can remember what I said. Uh, to the uh, to the next group that participates um, in the evening or in the late afternoon. So that said, it's uh, it's the end of our time together. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for taking the time to be informed. Uh, please help spread the news. Let others know that we're making this um, this two way engagement available to our families. I'm really proud of it. I hope you're proud of it too. And um, I look forward to, uh, to continuing the conversation. I'll let you know what I know, and that may be the new information. Uh, at four o'clock or at seven o'clock uh, today. Thanks again, everybody. And uh, I'll say goodbye for now. Thank you.